Joseph Mallord William Turner was one of England's greatest landscape painters. Turner had always been fascinated by architecture, and from 1807, three of his sketchbooks include drawings of alternative designs and additions for a house that he decided to build for himself in Twickenham. Turner did say to a friend at one point, if I could have my life again, I would be an architect. I think we're quite glad he didn't give up the day job, but uh, he did have this ambition and he's realising it here. During construction, Turner carefully noted the price of building materials, including two shillings worth of nails. By 1813, the house was completed. 200 years later, it still stands in a suburban back street in West London. A modest villa, which Turner christened Sandicum Lodge. This 19th century coloured drawing gives an impression of how Sandicum Lodge and its garden might have looked about 200 years ago. By 2015, Sandicum Lodge is in dire need of restoration. Years of neglect have taken their toll and repairs are urgently needed. This is a very significant building and it's absolutely essential that we restore it. It is a work by one of Britain's major painters. Restoring Sandicum Lodge to its original state and opening it to the public will cost the best part of two and a half million pounds. Raising that much money has been a massive labour of love. This project means an enormous amount to me personally. Yes, it has become an extraordinarily important and significant part of my life, of my family's life, and of other trustees' lives who've all worked very, very hard indeed. In December 2015, the restoration of Sandicum Lodge finally begins. It'll take a year and a half to complete the transformation, and there will be some unexpected discoveries on the way. Turner's love of the River Thames had started early. At the age of 10, he was sent to lodge in Brentford, where he discovered his talent through drawing birds, flowers and trees. In his famous painting celebrating the Prince Regent's birthday, the aristocratic figures in the foreground are eclipsed by Turner's loving depiction of the Thames behind them. I think Turner built a house here because he particularly loved this part of the Thames around Richmond and Twickenham. It is very beautiful today, still. So it's a great source of inspiration for him to be so close to the river. So why is a painter building a house? And Turner is a renowned painter even at the time when he's building this uh, property. He was fascinated by the relationship between architecture and the landscape, the tension between the built and the cultural and the unbuilt and the natural. And I think that fascination was something he shared with many of the period and would locate him very clearly in the Romantic tradition. I think that Turner saw this house as a retreat from London life, the art world, the Royal Academy, its committees, its warring factions, his house, gallery, studio with his mistress and her children and their children. There's no evidence that his mistress ever came here. It, it is most likely used it for fishing trips. We know he was a keen fisherman and 
I think it had that sort of moments of, of, of escape, really, from the busyness of his life in, in central London. And the people he chose to have here were not potential clients, they were friends and artists. And on one occasion, possibly a slightly riotous group from what was called the Picnic Academical Club, which was an excuse for taking a boat on the river with other academicians and getting very drunk and ending up on Eel Pie Island. <laughs> Turner has included some interesting architectural features in Sandicombe Lodge, such as these roll-moulded arches in the hall. And the staircase is quite grand for the size of the house and features an attractive coloured glass lantern light. There's a very interesting aspect to the story of Turner's house in the fact that Turner brought his father, William Turner, here in retirement. Um, old William was a barber in Covent Garden and Old William seemed to embrace life here at Sandicoon with uh, great energy and enthusiasm. He looked after the garden, he grew some vegetables, he kept house. Likely to have spent a lot of time in the basement. Um, it was where the cooking range was, I and mean, after all, he had to prepare his food every day, or at least we assume he did. And if he's doing that, um, he's um, more than likely spending most of the evenings there, keeping the fires alight, chopping the wood. We think that, that Turner's father took, took charge of, of the cooking very much in a rather rudimentary way. There is one account of him doing the same thing up in the West End premises where he managed to burn the chops. And there are also accounts of him not cooking terribly well because he's drunk rather too much and become a little bit of an embarrassment to Turner. In the years after Turner sold Sandicombe Lodge, subsequent owners made a variety of changes to the house and it gradually fell into disrepair. In World War II, it was requisitioned for use as a shadow factory to make airmen's goggles and the heavy stitching machinery damaged one of the ceilings of the house. But in 1947 it was bought by Professor Harold Livermore, who lived in it for the rest of his life. He then bequeathed it to the nation to ensure that Turner's architectural legacy would live on. Turner still does exist within this building because it is his own creation. I think that is very important. We've had a number of painters working here and a lot of them feel as they paint the building, as they paint the architecture, they feel very strongly that his hand is involved in this work. And so, yes, I think Turner is still with us in a three-dimensional building. It's an unusual aspect of his art. Some of the conservation work will be cosmetic, but in order to restore the house to its original state, there will also have to be some significant structural alterations. After Turner sold Sandicombe Lodge, an additional floor was added to the two wings on either side of the house. This gave the house a heavier aspect than Turner had intended. These additional floors will be removed altogether. It seems to me that the importance of the restoration we're undertaking is that we are attempting to conserve Turner's architectural imagination. It, more than anything else, that this building represents uh, ideas that, that Turner was thinking about and dwelling on and making proposals about in terms of a three-dimensional form. By the spring of 2016, Turner's little villa is completely enclosed in a cocoon of scaffolding. The house looks as if a bomb has hit it. Demolition of the additional side wings is well underway. Brick 
by brick, all the subsequent extensions, balconies and other additions to the house are being removed. Sandycombe Lodge is being stripped back to Turner's original vision. But at the same time, the conservation team are careful to retain all the original features of the house, even those which no visitor is likely to see. Two lovely chimney pots. Um, these have been obviously salvaged for reuse. Um, quite beautiful detail patterning. You think how high these are on the building and whether anybody can ever see them, but very beautiful decoration running all the way around the stars and sort of made with little, a little mould, I would guess, when the clay's still wet, just pushed in. Quite beautiful running all the way around the pot. This has a lettering on it as well, and probably a manufacturer's name, which I haven't been able to decipher as yet. It's only got the word Jones here, and it's only got the word Princess, and it's only got the word Lambeth. Yes, Lambeth, Jones, Princess, running round the pot. The gutting of the house has revealed a major surprise. Within living memory, Sandicombe Lodge has been covered in render, a smooth plaster-like finish that is applied on top of the brickwork and painted white. And the drawing of the house, done shortly after it was built, seems to show a rendered finish. But in the last few hours, the builders have removed the ceiling in one of the wings, revealing the original side wall of the house. Well, here we are, we've just taken down the ceiling, which was plasterboard, and what it's done is revealed an amazing piece of the building, which was a, a bit of brickwork hidden um, in the raised roof up here, um, exposed, uh, both this bit of brickwork and the bit of brickwork at the back here. Now, that's fascinating because we were expecting to find um, obviously render in that position because the main block of the building is rendered or has been rendered. That brickwork isn't uh, rendered, it's never been rendered. It's certainly not a mistake because the pointing, the mortar joints between the bricks has been very carefully prepared and struck with a penny line it's called. So this is uh, you know, really quite uh, compelling evidence of something we didn't expect and uh, it should be really interesting as we move through the project now as to how we resolve this particular issue. You know, buildings always reveal something you didn't expect and there's one. This new discovery of a brick finish contrasts with the apparent render or stucco finish shown in the original drawing of the house. What we've always taken as a source for what Sandy Kim Lodge looked like is this drawing of about 1813 by William Havel. And it does, if you think the house is stuccoed, then it does appear to look as though it is stuccoed. But then again, when we start to think maybe it was all brick, then you begin to think that you can see brick. I think it comes back almost to this situation of seeing what you think you know. I think it's quite difficult to draw bands and bands and bands of brickwork. I think it's maybe just a warm light and he's satisfied with that. I don't think I've got a better <laughs> explanation to offer. We really are at a, a turning point, a great discussion has to be held over this as to how we want to proceed. But certainly we can't, as it were, hide the evidence. We've made a great discovery here and it could be a very exciting one. The dilemma for the restoration team is whether to replace the decaying render or to strip the house back to brickwork as Turner built it. Gary Butler is convinced it should be stripped back. So here we are looking at the, the, the area of brickwork where the render has been removed on the back of the house and we've done an initial clean and you can just pick off the, um, the area of the um, brickwork here and you get a sense of what we, we have to get back to. Once we start to clean, it, clean away the paint and your eye is taken away from the, the sort of, if you like, the damaged paint surface, 
I think we'll have something that we'll be able to leave as a brick as a brick surface. It will look fairly rustic, but you can still see in this the um, penny line pointing joint um, running through the brickwork. But what about the apparent evidence of a render finish in the drawing and in the engraving that it spawned? The answer lies in a closer look at other engravings in the same series, which feature other well-known buildings along the Thames. I went back into the other engravings. We have the full set, there are over 70 of them, and looked at buildings which we know are of brick or brick with stone embellishments. One of them was Chelsea Hospital, essentially a brick building. And although the image is rather far back, brick courses are not shown. Equally, with the engraving of Garrick's Temple and Villa, a little further upriver than Santicombe, but not that far away, uh, the same thing. We know these are brick buildings, like Chelsea Hospital, they still survive. We can go and look at them. These are 18th century buildings and would have been known to Turner. Um, the, the, the brick courses are not shown there. And so I came really to the conclusion that it was not a convention to draw in meticulously every single brick course. It would be extremely difficult to do with a building that's away at some distance uh, and that only the overall form is being shown. So we felt that we could strongly support Gary's advice as a conservation architect that the house was indeed originally built intentionally in unrendered brick. I think that these, looking at these engravings, help to support that view. And so the Trust is very happy that Sandicombe Lodge, in its new manifestation, will be a brick-built building. Cleaning off the render and many layers of paint takes weeks. A high pressure powder treatment strips the paint away, but great care has to be taken not to damage the face surface of the bricks. Many hours of steam cleaning gradually do the job. When the modern methods are finished, the remaining stubborn specks of paint have to be painstakingly removed by hand. And as a final touch, once the cleaned bricks are pointed, a modern day penny line provides a precise match to the finish that Turner chose 200 years ago. Turner's delicate coloured glass skylight has to be removed for restoration. This will be a tricky operation that risks damaging the original glass. Well, this, this original structure has got some very fine cast lead details and you, you can see that in places it's coming away so the whole structure is liable to be a bit frail. How we lift this, how we get it out of the opening um, will be a fairly delicate operation. That's crown glass and that's only about a millimetre or a millimetre and a half thick. So as you flex the frame there's, there's a, a real danger to the glass of, of uh, crack in the glass. Losing the, um, the, the glass or, or um, it being damaged in any way would be a bit of a disaster, frankly. So we're hoping for 
better news rather than worse. Fingers crossed. After several hours of careful reinforcement and gentle persuasion, the team succeeds in removing the skylight. It's really pretty weak, the metal structure. Tim is OK. Come out OK. Um, and and unscathed, so if we pack it carefully for transport now, we'll be, we'll be home and dry and get on with the conservation work. 120 miles away, in the shadow of Wales Cathedral in Somerset, Holy Well Glass specialises in stained glass restoration. A young and skilful workforce applies traditional skills and endless patience to giving new life to damaged lead and glass windows from all over the country. Tucked away in the back of the workshop, Steve Clare is starting the lengthy process of restoring Turner's skylight. The glass is mostly intact, but the lead glazing bars that hold the glass in place are covered in layers of putty and paint, and in some places have separated from the wooden frame. Steve needs to decide whether the skylight is repairable or whether it must be renewed. The challenge is to take away all the uh, historic layers of decoration uh, and to stabilise the thing, but really not to go too far and to lose, lose the whole flavour and originality of it, because basically there's no absolute need to take it all apart and to renew much of it. Most of the original material is there and it's salvageable. And then we, we hope we can pick it up and mount it back into position. So we hope it'll sit there for a, a long time as part of uh, Turner's fantastic little lodge. He starts by applying a solvent that will help to strip away the layers of old paint and putty. You, you've got to have the, the right mindset for, for this sort of work. It takes a lot of hours uh, and it's risky because you're, you're scraping away layers adjacent to the thin glass. So there's a, there, there is a potential for disaster there. So it gently does it over a lot of hours, paring away the, with, with a scalpel until you get to the uh, lower layers of, of paint. But you can see that there's been some really ham-fisted repainting and redecorating over the, over the centuries. So we'll, we'll get back to these tiny lead sections and mask it all really carefully so that we, we just get paint on them neatly so the, the whole delicacy of the thing will be uh, regained. So far we've managed not to crack any more glass so it's sort of on, on tender hooks the whole time that you handle the thing. As Steve removes the layers of unwanted paint and putty, he uncovers more clues about how the skylight was originally constructed. I found, I found this little bit of um, tinned iron strip on, on the underside. Yep. And I think that originally that was soldered to the centre of this glazing bar and that these are just nail holes. So that, uh, so that, was, that was the original fixing strip. And if you look really closely, you can see a you can see a little rust line there, which uh, I think is the the edge of a strip like this. I'm wondering if I can reattach it, whether I can uh, clean the edges and resolder. Steve's patient work continues, back at Sandicombe Lodge, work is nearly complete on repairing the roof structures. Where possible, 
the builders have used the original timber beams. Where these were too damaged to use, they've jointed in new timber to make a structure strong enough to carry the weight of the covering of Welsh slates. Once the slates are in place, lead sheeting is placed over the wooden roof ridges. The modern methods of shaping the lead involves cutting it and welding the joints together. But in Turner's day, the lead was bossed or hammered into shape. Basically, we've got to boss, boss old style. We're just bossing it down and trying to get it nice and straight and level. We're trying to do it the, basically in the old fashioned way, traditional way that it was done for hundreds of years. So that's what we're trying to recapture. The, the modern way would have been we cut it down, heat chip, and weld with oxygen and settling uh, because they say like it's less stress for the lead. But I don't agree. Bossing, you can pack the lead. So it's thicker and more solid than it's in one piece. Back at Holywell Glass in Wales, Steve is seeing real progress. So if we, if we look at the original uh, glazing bar here with the uh, decoration, uh, build-up of decoration over centuries on it, it just, it's just a lump of uh, cream paint and putty uh, but if you look along this area where I've uh, pretty well cleaned off surface layers you can see that it's a, a really rather nice delicate lead casting uh, it's a drift as you can see there so I need to uh, solder it back into place but uh, you can begin to see the delicacy of it Soon, Steve is ready to start the delicate task of removing the damaged panes of glass. The work is as slow and painstaking as ever. A lot of this is like watching paint dry, I'm afraid. <laughs> Hours of scraping. And you can see that the, uh, the glass runs from much thicker in this section to very thin here so it's a it's almost certainly a piece of crown glass uh, so an, an original bit the uh, the crown glass method was um really uh, prevalent at this at the period the house was built um, and they blew uh really big crowns of glass which were um furled out using centrifugal force rather than blown into a, a cylinder um, and they became very adept at that period in, in spinning the discs of glass and they were quite often up to five six feet across so huge great things and so and so very thin and having great clarity which is what uh, what they wanted The porch at Sandicombe Lodge is in a bad state of repair. But beneath the cracks and the damage lies an ambitious design which is witness to Turner's early aspirations to be an architect. This is really interesting because here we have a porch which is really a sham. It's uh, made up of all sorts of materials intending to look like stone. This is a Roman cement render really with a, with a lime overcoat and then it's been scored through to make the uh, building look like ashlaring. And then underneath this cornice, which is extraordinary, is um, a SEMA reverse uh, moulding, but it's Egendart and it's made of cast elements. Each one of these is a small um, component. And then above that, which is extraordinary, uh, is, is a stone plinth. And then we go back to some um, Roman cement uh, render on brickwork and then a stone 
um, coping, which is quite elaborate in its profile, which has been de decayed away in several places. So the whole elements of the porch were, were sort of um, quite complex in their construction and all it, trying to look like stonework, a sort of cheap version of stonework. Turner doing a little bit of switched on um, classical design really, uh, being an architect in the way he probably wanted to be. The, the, the porch is in poor condition and we are going to repair it. We are going to recast these little uh, egg and dart sections and um, remake them. Most are, are, are heavily cracked or broken or indeed missing and so there's quite a lot of work that needs to, to go on here. Replacing the weather-beaten mouldings is a lengthy process. The first step is to make a silicon rubber mould of the least damaged section. This provides a basic template from which a first cast can be made. Once that cast and the mould are separated, work starts on cleaning up the cast to remove imperfections. Then another silicon mould is made from that cast to produce a second cast. This will be the master. More silicon moulds are made from it and the process of making the final casts can begin. Once they're broken out of the silicon mould, they're given a final clean-up. And at last, the process of fitting them into place in the porch can begin. In November 2016, the Skylight makes the return journey from Wells to London and is ready to be reinstated in Sandicombe Lodge. The Skylight has been cleaned, restored and reinforced, but it's still delicate and heavy. Coaxing it back into place will not be easy. Two men will manoeuvre the Skylight from below whilst a third squeezes into the cramped roof space to help it into place from above. And your end's going up first and we're going up the right end. OK, you got that, Chris? Yeah. At first, all seems to be going well. But just as the team try to settle the skylight into its frame, they hit a snag. That's interrupted right on that bit of wood, the bar. Ah, you're kidding me. No. Ah, God, that's not going to go in wood. What's the problem, Jack? There's a big... new bit of wood by the roof light is going to stop it going in with a handle. Okay, we're going to have to come down with that. And that the reinforcing bar on the top of the skylight. So, is coming up against a newly installed roof joist and stopping the skylight from sitting in its frame. Okay, right, I've got this end. Yeah. There's no choice but to manoeuvre the heavy skylight back down again and cut part of the joist away. The first attempt doesn't quite work so the skylight has to come down again. But eventually, Turner's 200-year-old wood, iron, lead and glass structure is once again safely in place 
and the team can fit the remaining pieces of glass. A particular detail that appears clearly on the early drawing of Sandicombe Lodge is a row of what are called triglyphs, a line of little brick ornaments either side of the top window, just below the roof pediment. In later years, these triglyphs were removed, possibly when the brickwork was rendered over. Now that the render has been stripped away, the remnants of Turner's triglyphs can be raked out and new ones created. It's possible that Turner added this decoration as a result of his friendship with the architect Sir John Soane. They're interesting because this is a detail that, that actually Sir John Soane uses in many uh, of his buildings, particularly the sort of primitive, smaller uh, buildings that he works on. They're, they're referring to the classical language of architecture. And this is detail presumably discussed between Soane and Turner um, as to how best to, to refer to the, the classical tradition in, the, in what is a really quite a rustic building. This one goes in, so I'll just hold that. We carefully stick it in. Making these new triglyphs is skilled work. What, what could be the problem here? The problem can be that where it's overhanging uh, so much and there's not a lot to put it on, is the bricks want to fall out. So I'm putting them in and then I'm going to fill this in to try and hold it and then I fill up the back to make it all solid. Um, the, the trick is, is not to mess about with them too much. So. This particular entablature comprises of a header course running along the top. These um, headers and then two soldier courses with a, with a small header underneath called a dental. Underneath the, the soldiers, holding the soldier courses up. Oh. <laughs> that happens sometimes because they're such a hard brick. They're very fragile, so that happens now and again. You just have to live with it. <laughs> now this should start tightening up. I'll push it up tight to that. How's it looking? It's looking very good, this happens. It's just, uh, always a good thing. I've been bricklaying for 32 years. It's interesting work. It's not work that you do um, on a normal building site. So, you know, it's interesting when you're taking out bricks um, and uncovering things that you didn't know was there at the time. So you have to be a kind of detective in some respects because you're trying to discover what they did years ago. So that's all very interesting for me. Gary Butler and a selection of the great and the good are clambering up the scaffolding to mark a significant milestone. Yeah, like a jack rabbit. It's the topping out ceremony, the traditional like celebration that. where the architect thanks the builders for completing the structural work on the house. And there's even a cake to cut. Thank you all for coming, but really the thank you stay is to all the builders Fullers, William, Dave White, all the chaps who work on it, Mark over the far side who's done all the brick laying. I'm going to run up to the scaffold and I'm going to tie a sprig of green onto the, uh, onto the building, a symbolic new birth. A sprig of green, well done builders, fantastic. Thank you Fullers for all your effort. And if I can make it stay on here, it'll be a surprise. Yeah. yeah, I really enjoyed the job. Great, <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. They're all yeah. longing for a bit of cake. Oh. Oh.
look at that. Brilliant. Terrific. Oh. This exceptional turning point in the conservation of Turner's House. The external envelope is completed and the scaffold will come down next week and then the internal fitting up will take place. So it's a great moment. <laughs> Another recent milestone for the Turner House Trust is the appointment of the celebrated painter Ken Howard as a patron of the charity. Ken Howard likes to paint to the strains of Rachmaninoff in his splendid studio in Kensington. And he's a lifelong admirer of Turner. Turner is the one man that I really do believe is an English genius, visual genius. I, I use the term genius very, very rarely, but Turner is one of the few English painters who I think you could define of as a genius. I suppose I quite like the idea that, like Turner, I came from, now I've got the violin out, I came from a, a so-called working-class background, which a lot of painters do. I mean, my great advantage was that my father didn't say to me when I said I wanted to paint for a living, don't do it, son, you'll never make a living. He just said, if that's what you want to do, you'd better do it. I've only got one thing to say, and that is I've got no money. So you'll have to keep yourself. And, of course, Turner was very much of that ilk. His father... His, Father was a, a barber, and Turner first of all showed his work in the barber shop. I think he used it really as a way of getting away from London, which I can understand very fully. And of course, Turner loved fishing, and he could have gone down and done his fishing on the river at, at Twickenham or Richmond. Recently, Ken Howard followed in the footsteps of one of Turner's many European trips. Switzerland is an astonishing place. It's very, very awe-inspiring. The mountains, the lakes, everything about it is, if you like, larger than life, which of course inspired Turner. Although the book is called In the Footsteps of Turner, we both worked in very different ways because most of the things in the book are paintings that I did actually on the spot, whereas Turner would have come back to London or in his hotel in the evening, he might have developed the drawing. But a completely different approach. I mean, Turner was, in a way, pre-impressionism. Pre and the Impressionists worked on the spot as I do because the Industrial Revolution had produced tubes of paint and you could go out and squeeze some paint on the palette and paint. Whereas in Turner's time, you would have had to go out and mix the colour or grind the colour even. Whereas after Impressionism, painters could work on the spot, a la prima as it's called, straight on. Back at Sandicum Lodge, attention now turns to the interior of the house. The 200-year-old floorboards are scraped rather than sanded to preserve their original look and feel. Ceilings and walls are lined using traditional techniques. First, oak laths are fixed to existing joists. The laths in the main bedroom are completed and ready for plastering. The traditional lime plaster that will be applied onto the laths consists of lime putty, sand and water, and it must be thoroughly mixed. And there's a secret ingredient, horse hair. You see the hairs in there? You see the hairs in there? <laughs> so it's, there's loads of hairs in it. You see them there, just, just standing up there. So that's what binds <clears throat> the lime putty and the aggregate sand together. The horsehair helps to bind the different ingredients together 
and it gives the mixture flexibility. So it just binds, binds it all together, that's all it's doing, the hairs is just binding it all together. Lime plaster takes much longer to dry than modern plaster. But there's a trick to speeding it up. Instead of smoothing it like that on the first coat, smoothing it, what I do is, you, what you need to do is open it up. So you scrape it, then the air, more of the air is going to get into that and try and dry it a bit quicker. So if you do that, that's not really... So if you try and just scrape it off like that, so it's showing a bit of grit, and then that should hopefully dry it a little bit quicker. Its flexibility is one of the reasons that lime-based plaster is enjoying a revival. Seems to be so much of the lime coming back now. You know, people using more lime, going back to how it originally would have been done, less cement. With cement, it just, if, if a building moved, that would just crack. With cement, it would just crack, and with lime, it moves about, so it's very flexible. It's time to decide how to decorate and furnish Sandicum Lodge. There's little historical evidence of how Turner finished the interior, so the conservation team brings in an expert. Helen Hughes is a paint detective. Her job is to work out what colour Turner painted the interior of the house 200 years ago. Since then, the woodwork has been painted over many times. Today I'm on site to actually remove some paint samples. <clears throat> um, and so we can take them back to my laboratory, I'll mount them in cross-section and look at them uh, under high magnification. So we'll be able to see all the layers that have been applied to the interior and hopefully we'll be able to establish and identify the ones applied by Turner when he first moved in. Um, so what I've done, I've made a, a sampling strategy and marked the location of all the samples I'm going to take. Uh, so what I can do um, to make my life easier, I can use a, a magnifier with an inbuilt light source. Just helps me see what I'm doing. And also I have uh, appropriate tools to hand. And of course, I've labelled up the sample bags. So I'm all ready to go now. We're going to take a paint sample from the door. This is so we can establish what the colour of the door was uh, during uh, Turner's occupancy. So I'll take a sample here, making sure that I've got some of the wooden substrate and all of the paint layers. And then I'll move on to another area here that we think might be a, a later insertion into the door, making sure to get all of the paint and a little bit of the wooden substrate. So I can take these back and then I can look at them under a microscope. Whilst Helen analyses the paint samples in her lab, another important clue about how Turner decorated the house has come from a much less scientific discovery. When one of the builders was clearing the loft space, he stumbled on some Victorian treasures leaflets, drawings and booklets. Many of them probably not Turner's, but an exciting find nevertheless. This is a drawing. It looks like um, a story from the Bible. It looks like a man making a sacrifice. One of them looks like um, a little poem. They're wonderful papers after such um, a long time. When, when I I found them. It was, it was, it was a joy. It was, I was pleased, you know, to uh, having seen, found something like this. I, I know that would be kept for ages to come. I, I, was, I was really pleased with them. I'm so happy that I, at least I'll be part of the history to have found things like this. But there was another scrap of paper in the loft that almost certainly did date from Turner's time in the house. A dirty, torn piece of wallpaper. The challenge now is to use this little fragment to create some new wallpaper that can be hung in one of the rooms in the house. 
the restoration team turned to Robert Weston, who specializes in recreating period wallpaper from original fragments. Clients range from museums to films such as Harry Potter and Home Alone. One of the projects that Robert is working on is based on fragments found under some parquet flooring. Using several differently coloured pieces, Robert must painstakingly work out exactly what the original design looked like and draw each of the layers line by line. Each of the colours will require a separate drawing, which must precisely line up to the others. It's a long, slow process. But not as much of a challenge as the Turner fragment will be. Well, th th this is relatively easy because there's so many large pieces to work from. But the problem is when it comes to something like the Turner fragment, where there's only one tiny little fragment, 13 centimeters square approximately, uh, and having to build up from that, there isn't even enough to get the whole design out of it. Robert's first step is to make a very high resolution scan of the wallpaper fragment. The scanned fragment is then transferred to the computer and the process of developing it into a full design can begin. All I have is a 13 centimetre square tatty old fragment, it's incredibly dirty. You see all we had, we have a tiny bit of something here, the rest of it's disappeared. Um, I like to use as much as I can of the original to recreate the recreation uh, rather than having to resort to making up of designs. Based on the design fragments, Robert can fill in the missing elements. It's taken, it's taken weeks actually, and it'll even take, take more weeks to get it done because it's I like to be as accurate as possible and not just throw it together. The original fragment has a background of tiny dots called pinpoints, each of which Robert has to recreate. It takes, it takes hours to get all the dots in the right place. It's like Lazarus, I suppose, coming to life again. <laughs> Over many hours of careful work, the tiny and dirty fragment found in the attic of Sandicum Lodge is gradually transformed into a recreation of the 200-year-old wallpaper design that Turner chose to grace the walls of his Twickenham retreat. A month later and we've had a chance to look at the samples I took and we've taken samples from other areas as well. So we've mounted them up and looked at them in high magnification under the microscope and I've taken some photomicrographs. And you can see here, if I expand this, this is the, the paint samples from that area here. You can see on the top here the cream white layers, the thick sort of you know, post-war modern layers that by sort of 1950s, 60s onwards. Um, and then coming down from that, you can see the dark, dark grain decorations that were there for, for most of the late 19th century, perhaps the early 20th century. And then getting down right to the bottom there on the surface of the wood, we can see a priming layer tinted with a little bit of red lead and then a very plain cream decoration. A very sort of normal domestic treatment of the joinery, uh, which we would really expect um, sort of in, in a middle class, sort of ordinary middle class house of the time. Helen has also discovered that the hall and stairs were originally painted using a marbling technique. So two experts are brought in to recreate that finish. Marbling creates the appearance of marble by painting and sponging patterns and lines on the walls. Well, with the backgrounds that we put on, there are two backgrounds that are put on loosely with cloth and with sponge. 
and that gives a print underneath that you can follow then and highlight and link these funny little shapes and hopefully end up with something that looks that looks pleasant, that looks believable um, at the end of it and also that doesn't argue with the block next door. So it's, it's putting it on and taking it off with more sponging if necessary until you stand back and, and you're pleased with, with what you see. The challenge mainly is keeping it as naive as we felt it would have originally been done. We were told specifically that this would have been done by the decorators, this wouldn't have been any, any type of artist that came in to do this and show off this was something at the time that would have been used um, in, in decoration. So their approach would have been quite fast and furious and, and they wouldn't have laboured too much over it, which is our tendency. We're used to copying marbles or making it quite flamboyant um, and keeping it as quiet as this house deserves, really. Um, that, that probably was the challenge. Tate Britain has an enormous collection of thousands of paintings, prints and drawings by Turner. Some is on display, but much has to be kept in store. Buried deep in the archive, is a precious possession of Turner's that he kept in Sandicum Lodge. It's a model ship in a case with a background probably painted by Turner himself that he may have used as a guide for some of his sea paintings. The Turner's House Trust has commissioned a variation of this model for display in Sandicum Lodge. In deepest Norfolk, that new model is taking shape. This is a model of a, 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 a third-rate British naval ship of the line dating to the late 1780s, 1790s. It's not a specific model, but it's inspired by a model in the Turner House that was made by French prisoners of war. Uh, they, they made models both of French and English ships. And uh, the, the planks are very clearly identifiable. What I've done is made the, the strips that form the deck and then I've painted the edges with black paint so that when they're put together and the surface is rubbed down, they, they resemble the, the black tarry caulking that would have gone into the original ships to, to seal the deck planks. The, the red paint used is very typical. Uh, I've heard stories that by painting things red in the ship in, in the heat of battle, the red paint didn't show the blood quite so much, but I'm not at all sure that's really true. Today's challenge is to make the dead eyes, the tiny fittings that will hold the rigging in the finished model. The way they're being made, I, I'm emulating the style of French prisoners of war here. It's kind of a simplified version of what would be on the, the real ship or a, a dockyard model of the real ship. And the pin, I'm simply pushing into place with a pair of fine pliers. It's much safer than trying to hammer the side of the, the model to put the pin in, and it works just as well. It's one of those jobs of which there are many in making models of ships that are incredibly tedious and repetitive and um, but the the enjoyment is is all in the the sight of the finished thing meanwhile kelvin's wife mary is painting the background to the box that will house the new model i 
I've studied the boxes at Tate Britain and the way Turner had painted the skies within the boxes. He, he was very careful not to have too much activity in the sky, just behind where the model would be sitting. Both Mary and Kelvin's attention to detail is painstaking. Mary has specially ordered the lead-based flake white paint, which was a favourite of Turner's. Meanwhile, Kelvin has started making the 70 tiny brass cannons that will be fitted into the model's gun ports, mounted on 70 miniature gun carriages. Although by no means finished, the model and box are taking shape. By the late summer of 2017, Kelvin's model is complete. And it's on proud display in Sandicum Lodge. After years of planning and fundraising, and a year and a half of building work, Turner's villa is complete. The render has all gone, and the original brickwork looks magnificent. At the front, the once dilapidated porch has become a welcoming entranceway. Inside, the paint analysis means that the decoration is true to Turner's designs. And the elegant staircase climaxes in Turner's beautifully restored skylight. The dining room has been carefully furnished in the appropriate style. The kitchen boasts a period range and dresser. A four-poster bed dominates Turner's bedroom. And the walls here have been decorated with the replica of that little scrap of paper found in the attic. It's symptomatic of the care and the skill that have gone into this project. I think the things that give me most pleasure is the fact that the house really is very beautiful. Although there have been challenges along the way. There was a period that Gary calls creative demolition, which I have to say did not look terribly creative at times. It just looked like demolition. And that was quite a scary time. And then, of course, it all began to come together to build up bit by bit. And eventually, the butterfly emerged from the chrysalis. And what might Turner have made of his newly restored creation? People do ask what Turner might think, should he be reincarnated and cross the threshold. Of course, it's very difficult to know what he might make of it. The spaces he would recognise with some familiarity. We hope that some of the decoration where he undoubtedly had a choice and made a choice and we have found what those choices were, that would be familiar. Maybe it's too tidy, but those are things that we have had to decide along the way. Maybe it will get less tidy as time goes by. And of course, could that happen? He'd be able to tell us an enormous amount more, but sadly, that's not going to happen. This is the embodiment of our past. So a project like this, and all historic building projects in some way, are about us holding on to something unique, our own past, in particular places. So. The, tr the trick here is that 
the value of a project like this is beyond its monetary value and beyond what seems a ridiculous sum to spend on a small building, but is about where we position ourselves as a, as a, as a society and our culture.